So hi everyone, uh, welcome to the Big Turtle Show. Um, this week we have uh, Samit Das and Debashish Banerjee. Uh, Debashish is an art historian and uh, based in California. Uh, and Samit is an artist um, from uh, Bengal, from Calcutta, and uh, doing some very... Yeah, no. Sorry. I'm from Jamshedpur. I'm from Jamshedpur, but last 24 years I'm living in Delhi. I see. Okay. Okay. So I'm a Bengali, but uh, okay. I'm born and brought up in Jamshedpur. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for the sorry, correction. Sorry to interrupt you. Thanks sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, Samit is doing some very exciting work, um, and I will let him explain uh, what he's up to. So, um, yeah, let's proceed. Uh, Devashish, would you like to start? Sure, sure, Vikram. Um, so, hello, everybody. This is Devashish Banerjee. Uh, I'm a, an art historian. I uh, teach at the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where I hold a professorship in Indian philosophies and cultures. And um, I've known Shamit Das for many years. Uh, he is an artist and a scholar of uh, Indian uh, modernist art uh, and architecture. And uh, so it, it's a pleasure to have him uh, and talk to him about the kind of work he does, which is a, a, a special interest of mine as well. Uh, so Samit, is a, uh, a practicing artist uh, who works on archives. And this is what's interesting, the way uh, we can develop a, a relationship with uh, Indian history in our present moment to contextualize where we are going. You know, our future can be a rootless future or it can be a future that is pushed by forces over which we have no control or we can have a deliberate relationship with the past in which we interpret how we are moving into the future. So this is what interests me about Summit's work. And uh, he has worked on a variety of media. And at present, he is living in Delhi and he has a, a, a recognizable status, both as a scholar, he has grown up in Shantini Ketan and uh, he uh, has written a book on the architecture of Shantini Ketan. And he's also really interested in looking at the period of Bengal art of the nationalist period and how that has to some extent been uh, relegated, uh, suppressed, and to some extent holds potentials for the future. So with that, I think I'll uh, let Samit speak a little bit about his interest in Indian history and in uh, art practice as archival practice. Samit, would you like to say something and then we can take the conversation further. Thank you, uh, Devashishta, Professor Banerjee. Thank you, Vikram. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Samit Das, an artist and researcher living in Delhi, studied fine arts from Shantaniketan and Kalahavan, and also the post experience program from Gaborville College of Art in London. That's all about the book art I have studied. Well, uh, Devashista has mentioned about my interest about the architecture of Bengal and uh, also uh, the Indian art history which is uh, related uh, with the Bengali school movement and also the archive. So there are few components which is very much uh, and, uh, closely integrated with my art practice. Earlier, I never had any idea about what is called archive actually. You know, from my childhood, I used to collect uh, these journals, magazine, greetings card, whatever, randomly. And I used to draw from them always I mean, I used to use those kind of a reference for my drawing. So that is a kind of a beginning of my use of archive, perhaps, when I recall my memories of childhood. That, that, that's the early stage of my understanding or engagement with the archive. Uh, 
Then later on, when I studied in Calcutta Art College one year, then I left the uh, college and joined Shantani Ketan. And it was a time, of course, uh, I was doing my dissertation paper. Before that, I didn't have much knowledge of Tagore or what the Bengal school is in that. It is all something to do with art historical studies. And as a student, I did it very superficial. It was not a very deep engagement, honestly, when I look back my student days. It's a very uh, clear self confusion So when I started doing my dissertation, then I realized it's a treasure trove material, treasure trove area to discover. And slowly I discovered it is not just architecture, it is not just a space, but it's a whole movement. So that brought me, that stage brought me to study the Indian art past and how one can connect with my art practice because I was looking at the visuals. I am primarily a visual artist. I'm not a Tagore scholar. I'm not a uh, kind of a PhD holder or something. No, but uh, as an artist, how to connect with those visuals apart from research? I was very keen. I was very interested, very much interested on that. So I have finished my course in Shantani Ketan. I did my dissertation. And of course, I started living in Delhi, doing my, started doing my job. But all those memories and resonance the whole idea of archive and historical experience remain in my mind. And I thought I have to continue with that. And I have to join those ideas into my art practice. So that's how it has started. And of course, uh, there are a lot of branches joined with it, like a technique when you uh, work with the visual art, techniques are very important thing. The city, I'm, I'm living in a city like Delhi. It's nobody's city. People live uh, in uh, Delhi for 30 years, 40 years. Still, they say, no, we don't like that. So it's very strange. And every time in city like Delhi, you need to fight for your existence. And that existence never questioned when you are in Shantaniketan. So it's a very complex layer to come up. So my work has that sort of a complex layer with the material, with the methodology. And of course, I use a lot of direct reference. As I said, in childhood, I was copying greetings card. I was copying the calendar, even the god and goddesses calendar. You know, those kind of things are very much interesting for me. So still, I use the reference in my work. Uh, yeah, yeah, very interesting, Shomit. So, uh, I think what is really interesting uh, is how you uh, have a conscious relationship with history, how uh, objects are placed in time for you. And uh, when you're talking about uh, Shantini Ketan, and when we think about uh, the entire early period of Indian nationalism, from say 1905 to about you know, 1915, 1920, that first phase, there was a very conscious attempt to visit the past. It was also a great period for archaeology. Uh, you know, even the the antiquity of Mohenjo-daro was being discovered in the 1920s. So we find that uh, how far does this identity construct of India go? That was itself in question. On the one hand, we have an orthodoxy, which is, you know, the legend and mythology that is constantly trying to push history back into some kind of prehistoric notion that we are that is legendary. On the other hand, we have an actual archaeological study that is going on that is trying to arrive scientifically at a understanding of roots. What is the root? Uh, so, uh, how do you relate to this, uh, Shomit? You also mentioned about this this fact about, you know, kind of copying or working with various uh, historical records. Uh, so, how do you relate to this uh, sense of the, you know, the, the early period of Indian nationalism and related to our understanding of present nationalism? Well, 
uh, it's a very complicated question. Let me go a little uh, uh, backdrop of my art practice. Uh, before I enter into archaeology, when I was doing the work with the Tagore Bengali school, then I find the Vivekananda's role. Of course, Vivekananda was a key figure to initiate a different movement, to make a conscious effort to look at village and rural and folk art. And then I thought how we can connect the whole archaeological exploration because that's a kind of a very early and uh, ancient idea of form of art. I mean, of course, those are the time art form or articulation or art criticism, art history was never constructed. There is no existence word called art in those days. And Definitely, those, uh, as Devashis mentioned, the Manju Darwan Harappa, which is kind of a very, very uh, strong, powerful resonance in my art practice, because those are very early reference of image making. Because as an artist, when I think of any image, I have to look for a reference, and everybody has to look for a reference. Otherwise, how an image will develop? Because developing image takes ages, years, maybe a few hundred years, you know. So within five, 10 years, it is impossible to develop any image, the visual language. So visual vocabulary has to have some link from uh, the past. There is no other way. So that is the reason even I went back to the archaeological reference directly. And also it is interesting, you know, uh, Gali Krishna Thakur's house got first, uh, they were hold the first exhibition of Manjodaro's uh, excavation object. In, uh, yeah. in Kolkata, where right. whatever uh, Rakhal Dash Bandubadha has exhibited, yeah, the uh, Kali Krishna Thakur uh, uh, kind of uh, hosted that whole exhibition in his house. And I visited mm. the, that house, it's quite exciting actually. You know, that energy brought me, and of course, when you look at archaeology, when you study the images, it dissolves your ego because thousands of years, I mean, uh, kind of a civilization, uh, it is under the ground and still it is alive. Right, yeah. right, right. Quite, quite, quite. Yes, in, indeed, indeed, Shomit. I think that's what I find about your work, where uh, there is a certain kind of spirituality in uh, the relationship with, uh, direct relationship with visual form. You know, I mean, which is interesting, which is very different from looking for spirituality in legends, mythologies. There is a visuality component and you're looking for that going way back into archaeology and into a search for uh, archaeological roots of uh, visual form. So, uh, you know, you just talked about going to these sites, looking at these forms and the kind of charge you felt, you know, that there is, in a, in, in a sense, a subjective kind of emotion and a subjective shakti, one may say in uh, relating to these moments of history that are almost like, uh, you know, they have their own spiritual power. So, uh, you, you know, would you like to say something about how that emerges in your art? You see, the word you were using spiritual, of course, uh, you know better than me, it's a huge and very vast. It has got a lot of different direction and depth, but definitely what I believe in art and visual language, it is a time, it is a moment when I can really see the image. You're looking at, let's say, some pot of Manjadar Harappa or some, any object, let's say one glass. But one fine moment, you realize some energy, some image from that. And that will never come back again to you. That's very important for me. And that is the beauty of the art of Bengali school, the art in Asia even. And that makes very, very extraordinary from the Western art. And of course, the modernism, what uh, the term we are using, the Vashis the mentioned, because I'm interested because India is a country here, we have a complex layer, different language, different zones, different state, different economy, different belief. So there is a folk, there is a legend, there is a myth, there is a oral history, there is many layers. It's not just a metropolis where 20 artists or 30 artists work. So our modernism cannot be same as a Western modernism. 
the way they have looked at the whole economical structure, the industrial development, uh, development uh, the construction of the historiography, all these things are completely different than us. So idea of spiritualism again come to me in that way. It is a kind of a real self-realization when you connect through your inner energy with that object, with that sight. Yeah. Let's say mm -hmm. a very simple example. Every day you do drawing, but one day you enjoy most. How and why it happened? I think uh, that, that, that's the kind of idea of spiritualism or spiritual aspects, I believe. Otherwise, if it don't happen, you cannot repeat actually. Right, right. I don't know whether I'm right or wrong, but this is my no, sure, basic sure. No, I, I think I, yeah, I understand what you're saying, which is exactly what I find interesting about how uh, your engagement with these objects from the past connects you to the roots of, of a language, uh, of a visual language that becomes alive in a sense. It, it informs time. And it comes, to, speaks to you today. And in that sense, it brings the entire train of history with it into that relationship, making you want to repeat it from today's vantage, in a way. And I find that uh, I, I see uh, a, a lot of your work has to actually do with archaeology, that you're actually looking at excavations, sites, uh, you know the 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 the, the diagrams, uh, you know things like that, and objects, uh, people working, uh, real sites and things like that. So that is one entire uh, genre of work that 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 interests you. Is is it not? What are the various areas that you've looked at there, and what what has it inspired you know, in terms of the series that you have? Uh, developed. See, uh, 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 I mean, I must say there are a few layers uh, in this uh, area. When I was uh, doing the Tagore project, definitely I've, I have started to looking at the whole idea. Uh, uh, I mean, realizing 20,000 or more than 20,000 photograph, the whole book, the text, the essay has built up from the visuals not from the text actually. I never read Ravindra Rachanabuli, the Tagore essays first. I started looking at the photograph. The same thing I was realizing when I saw the Tagore family was sitting in the southern veranda with some uh, small folk toys. And then I see those toys has been uh, painted and drawn by Tagore family member like Avanindranath and Avanindranath in their painting. I got surprised and I said, okay, this is the study. So that is how they are uh, kind of looking at the past and bringing back to their own studies. It's a very interesting point. That is the initial. Then again, I realized, okay, how, how come Vivekananda's philosophy, he was never an artist. Then again, I look back his writings and his uh, uh, travel route. Then I find whatever he has seen and he has written, which is incredibly important upon Indian art. And then, of course, the archaeology uh, um, is a subject where you start looking at the different form, different drawing, different structure. Of course, it has started with a different belief. And of course, they are, I'm sure they also have a spiritual belief because otherwise they would not make such a fascinating mother goddess and uh, other yeah. areas. It is not yeah. just for the worship. It is, I mean, yeah. the ports are not just for the storage of uh, these uh, uh, food grains to save exactly. the food grain. Because uh, there are certain shapes, there are certain dynamics. Uh, yes. And also the archaeological site itself it's a very intrigue movement when you look at the sectional view itself yeah. is a picture itself mm -hmm. is a picture actually and of course in the visual language again if i bring back to those elements i need to make a gateway to invite audience to yeah. read the visual language mm -hmm. because textual mm -hmm. language is one side visual language is one side so right. that's how it goes with me actually Yes, 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 yes. What are the sites that have interested you, Shumit? Which are the, the, the specific archaeological sites that uh, are images, photographs, actual uh, sites that have drawn your attention? See, this uh, Lothal is quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. And also, 
uh, the Sigiriya site, the archaeological stream, there is excavation happening. Those are very, very interesting. And of course, the ASI journal, what I have experienced, I mean, uh, written by Oral State and many other ASI uh, authority. It is amazing the way they have done the entire documentation, drawn the maps. It's a very meticulous practice, actually. It's a very meticulous practice. I mean, I, of course, uh, I didn't have much chance to visit actual archaeological site, but of definitely through the museum, through the books, through the videos, different way I have experienced. But uh, every time it's a new reading. So I find, of course, the rereading of archive, the animating the archive is also very important in my art practice. Of course, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. I think exactly what you're saying with the actual site has been carried into a variety of recorded forms which constitutes the archive and it is that that you find really interesting and important is it not it gives us the sense of historiography that over time we are repeating our gaze into the past and we are reconstructing our relationship with the past and you are doing the same in a way you're looking at all these various layers of looking at the past, is it not? Yeah, it is actually. See, uh, again, uh, when uh, Vivekananda was telling Sister Nivedita or Okakura, he please visit those potters, uh, the villagers, the village Terakota temple in the rural area of Bengal. And I visited Artpur and I find, yes, why Vivekananda said it is a very, very uh, exceptional Terakota temples are there, even the right. painted scenes are there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is important to know why he said that actually. And what is the exceptional thing? There are many terracottas, but what mm -hmm. makes him to make the, uh, give that statement on? Mm -hmm. So those elements kind of a energize my art practice. You know? Sure, sure, sure. Yes. You know, you know, right actually, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Go yeah, on. Yeah. Yes. No, I was Hello. going to bring Vikram into the conversation because Vikram and I uh, may have made a film. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear Hello? you. Yes, I can yeah, hear yeah. you. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So Vikram and I have made a film uh, in which in a similar way, we are looking at indigenous forms at, uh, at, at, at religion from the viewpoint of art. I mean, how does, uh, you know, how do we understand it outside of ritual? How do we look at just form? So, uh, it, Vikram, would you like to uh, bring in some of that, uh, you know, investigation into this conversation with Samit? I think he seems to have disappeared. Uh, maybe he lost his link or... Yeah. Uh, can you message him? Or yeah. Could I try to... I, I think he'll come back. Let me see. Yeah, I think he just came back. Namaskar. COVID-19 unlock ki prakriya ab pure desh mein shuru ho gayi hai. Aise mein apne gharon se bahar tabhi. Ha, tumhe shayad. Ha, kyon lo Shumit? Tumhi beriye ga chuna ki kete ga lo? I think uh, is uh, is there a sound lag from your side, Summit? I think he's having difficulties with the connection. He's yeah. frozen. Yeah. This happens quite often on Zoom uh, because people are in different time zones and with different yeah. connections. So it happens a lot. Yeah, you cannot control it actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, and it's been raining a lot here. I, I think he was just saying that in Delhi, the weather has been really here too in, in Calcutta. Okay. Yeah, here too in San Cristobal. It rains for half the day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, wait. I let me pause this recording till he comes back on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Hi, Summit, are you there? Can you hear us? I think he's getting kicked out. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Are you back yes. on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I don't know what's wrong. It's okay. I had paused the recording, but now it's Is back it on. Is okay now? Uh, how can you hear me, Summit? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. Yes, I can hear. Okay. Yes. Your okay, picture sir. seems to have frozen, though. I think my my connection has some problem. Anyhow. Okay, Summit. Yeah. Do you want to continue with this session, yeah. or do you want to come back uh, some other day? Uh, Maybe we should come back because today it's creating some problem, and uh, I think the whole uh, tuning and the motion is creating a trouble. So once it is it is get distracted, so <laughs> I don't think so. So uh, should we come back uh, another day? Yeah, yes. I think so. I think uh, because uh, otherwise it will keep on bouncing back and forth. So I think let's wait for a day which is a little more yeah, it is, stable. It is yes, yes. It's happening because today in Delhi it's a heavy raining and I don't know because of that some problem happening or not. Just now I have Must connected be. with my mobile. Yeah, so I don't know. Sorry. I mean, I don't know. Oh, you connected with your mobile phone? Yeah, right now I have connected with my mobile phone because the broadband is not working at some point. Okay. Okay. If you want, we can go a little longer and try out with the mobile phone if it if it continues. Would you yeah, want yeah. to do that? Sure. Yeah. So, so yeah, Vikram, why, why don't you kick in and kind of uh, uh, talk to Summit a little bit? So Summit, you know, I had actually attended a session at this um, Kiran Nadar Museum uh, in Bombay. And, uh, you know, several months ago or maybe a year ago, um, and this session was hosted in a, in, a, in a space where they have these discussions on art. And Kiran Nadar initiates many such events. And um, there was a lady, she's an art historian. Her name is Zera Jumaboy. And she works in, uh, in the UK. And she curates... Uh, exhibitions and so on. So her focus is Indian modernism. And she was at the time, uh, she had come there to talk about the Bombay progressives. Okay, the PA, the, the progressive artist group. And, you know, what I found was she had a, she was fixated on this notion of Indian modernism being derivative of European and American uh, influences and not being original and um, you know so she the, the whole uh, discussion was centered on this which i think was a very personal thing for her because she's a immigrant and she was trying to justify and uh, you know very vigorously show that no these are not derivative you know these have uh, their own unique characteristics. And she was focused, of course, on the Bombay, on the Bombay crowd, uh, Souza, Raza, and, and the rest of them. So, um, and this seems to be a tension that I, I, I come across a lot. Um, I mean, in a globalized world, I mean, do you actually, because influences are, you know, the borders are permeable. People um, derive and are influenced either subconsciously or consciously. Uh, you know, you cannot help it, whether you're a filmmaker or a, a writer 
or anything, musician. Um, but would you like to speak to this as far as the unique characteristics of Indian modernism uh, versus a modernism elsewhere? Uh, or is there really a difference? You know, because I see a modern art in other parts of the world also very much, you know, lots, many of them have uh, been inspired by pre-modern art. You know, even, even people like Jackson Pollock and, and others and Picasso and, you know, they talk about, there was an exhibition in New York that I attended where all these American masters and their, the influence of Mexican art on the American mass, on American modernism, you know, pre-modern. And again, Mexican art, when I talk of Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, again, what a huge influence their pre-modern traditions had on them. You know, uh, so is this, you know, can you maybe talk about this in the context of Indian modernism? And how do we define modern today? That's a big question, Vikram. How do we define uh, modern today in context of India? Because uh, uh, personally, I felt that uh, uh, the, if you consider the idea of modernism, uh, in context of waste, uh, they have a very different perspective, as I have mentioned earlier. But in Indian, Indian, Indian context, the civilization is very, very old, and we, we, we had a very rich tradition. And the tradition uh, again and again come back and kind of a uh, influence the artistic practice. And also, the different parts of India it has a very, very different experiment, like as you mentioned, the Bombay. So definitely there are certain things happen in Bengal, certain things happen in Western part of India, Central India maybe, something happened in the villages of India, the village artists, because this is also a very complex area, uh, whom we are including modern. Because normally artists, whenever art historian speaks about modern, they speak about that artists who trained in an art college or they have studied uh, art and some are in a legitimate institution, but who have not studied art formally. They inherit art through their life. How do you define that? So all these complex questions are there. So in that case, my idea is not to look at kind of a, uh, the terminology like a modern or postmodern something, but maybe in context of India, I would prefer the decades, some few decades, you know, some year wise, maybe let's say 20 to 60, 20 to 30, maybe 1900 to 1920, something like that, or before 1900, let's say uh, 1700 to something like that. You know, that way, maybe better understanding uh, in case of Indian art. I don't know what, what is the idea of the what is the, but what I realized this is very complex issue because whenever this uh, modernism or modern art in India, the book has been written. It is not very inclusive. It is not very extended studies. And one point I must appreciate that with the Bengal, which is not done by uh, Bombay or the southern part of the Indian art is, the Bengal has done extensively research on the past. And they want to bring back into their own context, own language, you know, and uh, they want to contextualize uh, with their own time. So that practice, I don't know, I'm very much fascinated about that because Bombay and uh, Delhi, it has a very different, Delhi Shilpi Chokro has a very different practice. And mostly the Bombay artists, this Raza Susa and all, they all studied abroad. And in 2017, I did a whole show in Paris as part of my fellowship. Uh, it is all about uh, that uh, artist, uh, many artists, whatever I can access in Paris because or getting original work is very difficult. So Raza, uh, this uh, Nirod Majumdar, there are many artists, Zarina Hashmi, there are many artists I have included in that show. And then I looked at finally Jean Bonagari's film event. And of course, they're all coming back to Indian root. Right. I mean, uh, they, they could not really sustain, I should not use that word sustain, but they could not follow that whole idea of a Western trail. 
And in that case, if you look at the books and journals published from the West during 1900s, 1920s, 1940s, many of them I'm having in my collection. I, I must say that whatever Avanindranath and his followers were doing, the way they have started, they have initiated, that is much more powerful than anything else in India which is not discussed properly. Normally we say, oh, Bengali school, that's a kind of a lyrical painting, the lady is sitting under the tree or something other. But it is not true, actually. It is not true at all. And these huge, wide experiments is not happened in Chennai, neither in Bombay, nor in Delhi. In case of theater, in case of literature, in case of furniture, education, I mean, the whole thing started from the Jorashako house and extended to Shantiniketan and many parts of the world. Bengali school may be a working term, but it, it extended throughout the whole India. I think I must uh, uh, <laughs> go to Devashis. The Devashis that would have a uh, yeah, yeah. better knowledge than me. Yeah, no, no, no definitely. No, I think it's a really important point that uh, you're making, Shomit. Actually, because that early period of nationalism uh, was centered in Bengal and in Calcutta. So this mm -hmm. looking back at history was something which was begun over there. You, you talked about, uh, you know, the Indus Valley uh, exhibition. You, you talked about, you know, the way in which there was a very conscious attempt to look into the past which was a scientific, you know, even people like historians like Jodunath, Chorkar, etc. There was, it was less, I mean, and, and actually there was a convergence of this looking at uh, mythology and legend, etc. But not looking at it in a legendary way, looking at it in a historical way, looking at it in an archaeological way. So this relationship with the past was very strong. But what happens after the 20s uh, in Indian nationalism, there is a greater urge towards becoming free. But that urge also loses that connection with the past. And it also becomes splintered into urban and rural kind of realities that have different durations. The time, uh, you know, relation it, it changes. And one of the things that happens when we're talking about PAG, the Progressive Artists Group, which begins in the year of our freedom, 1947, is that they firstly are, most of them are minorities. You know, most of them are kind of either Muslims, Christians, uh, Dalits, and they belong to another uh, kind of a very interesting peripheral notion of the nation that is also part of India, that, that also is part of India and, uh, and the nation. And it is not true that they don't have a relationship with the past. I mean, of all these artists, I mean, Shomit was talking about how Raza goes back to the past in a really big way. Yeah. Most of his later work is that, yeah. the, the, the new tantric work. But what I find really interesting is Hussein. Hussein is, is, is conducting an archival study all his life. Yeah. Even Not only his mythological paintings, every painting, even if you look at the gestures, the way people stand, the way people are positioned, they have references to specific periods of Indian art. He is extremely erudite in terms of his relationship with Indian history. So I think that uh, that kind of notion of Indianism uh, is much more self-conscious in the Bengal uh, early period. And that is why I, I see Shomit interested in that. But it also continues in its own way in, in these other less, uh, more dilute kind of, you know, attempts to construct a past. Yeah, I mean, it's very right. And also, you see, as a visual artist, my idea is to bring back the history or the historical images of the whole archival uh, conversation through my art practice. Because one side, the scholar, they write. There is a textual disc uh, discussion through the text, your understanding. But how one can understand through the images, that is also important. And also uh, the reprographic system the technology. I mean, these are all very important to understand the art history. Like uh, Major Gill, who documented uh, Ajanta, 
uh, even uh, after some time he has documented uh, with that uh, twin lens camera and that gives a very different perspective of ajanta and uh, i have seen many of those photographs and then after that yashdani there are many people year after year they have documented ajanta and every documentation has his own perspective so and that is also a very interesting reading of artistry i believe so how Absolutely. artist engagement can come together into that because always i find this one side is a curator one side is art historian scholar academic and the practicing mm -hmm. artist you know it's a big conflict sometimes happen and i thought let's it, it's a, it, of course it's a drop in the ocean i'm not the person to sort it out or bring everything together but it's just a effort is a small effort to bring everything together and to make understanding make things comfortable make things kind of a uh, vernacular you know if you don't know the efficient language efficient vocabulary okay you look at the image how it, it can be uh, connected with your mind you know the mindscape goes to the past so all these things it's a whole process i can't say i am successful i can't say it is done that's why i don't keep any single uh, name of my work yeah, i mean it's a whole series i call is index of our untold stories or bibliography in progress apologue archaeology it's like that and archaeology as i said it's a very very important part and i mean i'm interested why um, the general historian i mean i mean general means i don't know whether it is the right term or not the academic historian who kind of uh, construct the other histories like pali jukes uh, 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 shena jukes whatever so but those historians has a very very important uh, statement on archaeology what about art historian and after uh, mid 80s or early 90s or maybe before little before that archaeology uh, the folk legend mythology it's all left behind it's just few artist who is constructing modernism how can it possible right no it's very interesting actually uh, shomit also what you just said about technology and the way in which different versions of our relationship with the past are mediated by technology and how we can bring all that into the art practice because in, in, this is historiography actually it is the, the the graph of history not only just history you're not looking for an authentic origin you're looking for ways in which that origin has been reproduced over time and in each of these reproductions there is erasure there is suppression there is selection there is highlighting and it creates history our our uh, historiography creates the future actually so your uh, ability to bring that into your work in a way is also it's interpretive you are interpreting the archive to show the things that are hidden things that are made more important or less important so that we can actually now see that this there is another alternative picture towards our past and our future so that is another thing i find really interesting about your work yeah i mean if you look at uh, shibramurthy's book if you look at stella cramrys if you look at andre zimmer and now if you go to the same same places with a camera you will never have such photograph you will never have that angle because the lens doesn't exist the technology of photography doesn't exist in that sense but again if you go back to uh, the william greeks publication uh, those lithographic prints and uh, the taj mahal decoration or many other publication greeks has done it itself is art actually one can really look at those plates and some of the plates uh, made out of 5000 litho stone i have seen some of the books in uh, uh, this uh, uh, national art library bna they have those books and once you look at those books you have a different reading uh, with the past so uh, vikram i think again i don't know whether i have given your answer the idea of modernism in india it's not very easy it's a complex you see they are wasted when 
many years they didn't acknowledge, they didn't reveal clearly straight away that Picasso has influence from this African mask and on FSEC, except one painting, the last there was those, there was those that, you know, something, I, I don't know whether I'm uh, right pronunciation or not. But uh, now I have seen in 2017, 18, uh, there the a new Picasso museum, Museum de Picasso, they are showing everything openly. Because French has come out and says, no, we need to acknowledge the past. Correct. Yeah. That's very important. And beginning of my discussion, I was uh, talking about the image making process, how you think actually, how the image come into your mind. Artists, we say, oh, we make it. We have developed it. But how? Like your author, they read maybe a thousand books or maybe a few hundred books to write one book. Right. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I mean, when you look at even, uh, you look at Indian pre-modern art or other cultures, African or Mesoamerican, and of course, you know, what we call modernism today is a lot of those elements you can see, you know, a thousand years ago. So, and you look at Indian tribal art also and how those motifs are, being reproduced not just by Indian painters but by European painters. You look at sculpture, you know, uh, Giacometti, Giacometti, his elongated uh, sculptures, you know. I mean, those existed a thousand years ago in Africa, you know, those types of uh, creations. So, so, yeah, there's a lot of this going on, of course, and um, it's hard to. The only thing I don't know, you know, maybe. If you look at abstract expressionism, pure abstract expressionism, like Gerhard Richter and, and people in that uh, mold, um, I'm pretty sure even that has a, a precursor in, in the pre, in the pre-modern era. And Jackson Pollock and people like that, you know. Though I don't I don't know the specifics, but I'm sure it can be traced back this so-called abstract, which is which is raw creativity, you know, this is like raw, this is the unprocessed uh, matter of, of creativity when you see abstract expressionism. Uh, before, you know, it's like the, 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 this raw information as it, before our senses uh, crystallize it into meaning, you know. So, um, so yeah, I see a lot of that and it's very interesting. And also, if you look at the old publication, like uh, I have some of those the time lapse series, a famous time lapse series, the illustrations and now Asian and Far Eastern, and also the African and pre Columbian civilization has right. certain resonances, the inner current. Right. It has shown in the book actually. So old books has a very, very important idea as how they prepared the book, the concept of book, which is very fascinating. I find even in India, like Provashti and Modern Review of the Chatterjee's Pictures album. And there are many art journals happen, the cultural journals happen. They used to cover the entire world. Provashti and Modern Review, they have published the new technological invention those days. Right. I can't imagine that thing can happen in those days. <laughs> Some Bengali sitting in Allahabad and Kolkata and looking at the world inv invention and the scientific invention and they are publishing it. So right. this even idea, even when you yeah, I was going to say even if you look at uh, the attempt to connect with the rural roots, you know, the folk roots, you know, like when Abhinindar uh, wrote uh, Banglar Broto, where he's looking at the exactly. uh, Alpona forms. Uh, he's making comparisons with Mexico over there. He's actually talking yeah. about rituals in Mexico and the designs over there. So it was a really an, a, a time when people were looking back in the past, not merely from an indigenous point of view, but in a very fluid manner, in a, in a kind of a porous manner. There was a kind of a structuralism of uh, universal forms that was attempted to be decoded. It's an interpretive. I mean, these are all yeah. amateur anthropology. It's not 
scientific anthropology of the academics, just like you said, if the artist looks at forms and they create their amateur anthropology, I think that's really important. That's how we individually create our own vocabularies, our understandings. So that that's that's what I see. Tell me, uh, Shomit, also about your relationship with the city, because I see a lot of paintings. And you also told me earlier about man-made cities, recent cities, and old cities. I mean, when you look at even Shantiniketan, both Shantiniketan, Kolkata, Jamshedpur, where you come from originally, they are relatively recent cities, though they've seen a lot of change. But Delhi is a very ancient city. It's a, almost a legendary city. So uh, how do you relate to the city in that, in that sense? A lot of your work is about cities. See, I, I born and brought up and grown up in cities like Jamshedpur. And Jamshedpur is a man-made space. Of course, mm -hmm. there was a mountain, there's hillocks and things like that. And Tata's, they built up the city. It's a very, very modern and planned cities. Of course, after that one year, I was in Kolkata. It's an urban structure. And then I shifted to Shantaniketan for seven years. We all know Shantaniketan is a man-made space. It started from the barren land. And Delhi, the modern Delhi, what I, I live and where I live, where I belong, it, it is something different. And again, it's a man-made space. It has nothing to do with the old Delhi and ancient cities. Right. And, you know, the question of existence, the struggle, that attracts me from Delhi cities. Because Delhi questions every moment who you are, how you are living, how you are doing, what's happening with you. This is a very, very psychological questions and dialogue all the time happen. Shantaniketa never asks that question because you are under shade of that university and the aura of Tagore or many other things. I'm not saying positive or negative, way, but this is a fact because I stayed there as a student. So it was there. And of course, definitely the space started questioning me. Why I like that space, the hostel, under the tree or something, how the space has been created. I never had any idea that there was a plan behind that. Even the cactus, the cactus planted uh, over there with a plan. Rathindranath Tagore and Shurendranath Kaur, every day they used to have a meeting, what to do and what to plant and what to construct in the uh, Shantani Ketan. I never had that looking at when Once I uh, look at the letters, then I understand who oh, wow, it. that's the thing. The same thing when I come to Delhi, I have to omit and forget everything about Shantaniketan and start to question who I am. Because all those seven years I was under shade of that aura. The Delhi, I have to start a whole new body of Samitnas. And of course, Delhi, again, it's a city, lives with the history, history and contemporary. And most of the Indian cities, which lives with the history and contemporary. So how you are having a dialogue with that? Once you are in old Delhi, you have a very different dialogue with that. Once you're in an urban structure, very modern flat, like where I live, it has a different dialogue. But every time I need to keep alive my visual integrity and visual language. So that's how the whole struggle and the multi-layer, the complex uh, route that engage into my art practice. And that is one reason I work with the artist book mm. and multi-layer because I never satisfied with the one layer actually. I never successfully the one layer sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's very interesting. Um, Debashish, would you like to talk about your book? I know we are uh, also going to do an interview in print, but uh, that is something I wanted to touch upon, you know, vis a vis. Uh, how we approach art and how it is deployed as a tool of the state or to deconstruct the notion of a nation state and how that played yeah. out. So is that, can you speak to that please? Yeah, it's interesting. Actually, that's how Shomit and I met. Uh, you know, I gave a talk about my book at JNU and that's where Shomit was uh, present when, when I met him for the first time just after the book came out. So the book is about Abhinindranath Tagore and the origins of the Bengal school. Uh, but it, it takes a kind of a, 
a, a slightly alternative view of the entire idea of nationalism. Avanindranath is usually seen as the father of Indian nationalist art. But if we really look at his work, we find that there is a constant kind of, you know, he, he keeps doing new series where he shifts from what he was doing earlier. And in each of these, he is trying to look at the idea of the nation in a very different way. He's not happy about stereotypes. And this is exactly where we find that normally nationalism is all about building stereotypes. Nations come into existence partly through images. And they create these images that they reproduce and make into mythologies of the nation. And, you know, those mythologies, we are seeing that a lot right now because we find that the whole idea of a Ram Rajya, for example, is being mythologized and turned into imagery that people are living in dramatically in their lives and pushing upon the whole nation. But in the nationalist period that we are talking about, there was a, a, a pressure to do that. But artists like Abhinindranath were resisting that. They were creating forms and breaking those forms, deconstructing it, moving to something else looking at another way of understanding that entire thing. And the way I've, I've tried to deal with that in my book is to show how the nation to some extent has to have an identity. But the responsibility of the artist or the creative person is to show that that identity has to keep deconstructing itself. If you make an identity that is stereotypical, then you basically are feeding into some kind of fascist view of the nation. But if at the same time you are constantly bringing in new narratives, the narratives of the people who have been denied, whose voices have been suppressed because of the selection process of creating a nation, then you keep the dialogue alive. And this keeping alive, you know, this is also partly, uh, you know, what interests me about Shomit's work is that the, the, under the ground, there are the ruins of the past that we also are suppressing to some extent. We are building on top of, but at the same time, those things are living in us and through us. They are the ghosts, the specters that are in our, you know, minds and in our hands, but we deny them. So to some extent, the book is talking about that. It's talking about how a responsible artist has to keep changing uh, their own focus. The, you know, that, that's another thing that uh, Shomit and, uh, you know, I can ask Shomit about as well, which is about the notion of style in modern art. Uh, st we, we normally try to uh, stereotype artists by their style. You know, all the paintings of a certain person can be recognized by style. This is also an art historiographical thing. Art historiography is about establishing styles, periods of history, names, and styles. Well, actually, you find that there is no need to do that. Our identity is actually something which needs to change, and our style is related to who I'm becoming right now. I find that, would you like to talk about that, Shumit? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, you see, as an artist, as a contemporary artist, even always uh, uh, I have to listen that, oh, uh, why don't you develop a style, you know, and also the auction houses and uh, when the gallery comes in the commercial aspect everywhere, it's all about the style. But what is style exactly? What is the integrity of style? And that is totally when it distorted and deconstructed by Avanindran. He never established anything. And I think many people, they misunderstood that whole movement as a narrow nationalism. It was never, as the Vashisda mentioned, that uh, if, you meant, if you built up a style, it's a kind of a whole fascist order. Okay, this is the order, this is the style, this is the thing you have to do, this is I made it. No, nothing like that. Every time it is changing because your life is also changing. Your life is also changing. Like Avanindranath said uh, regarding uh, Alpuna, he's a female. 
why we need to preserve that right it's a fascinating actually so in case of art also we never live a same life we, we cannot have the same realization so making superficial style in context of modernism or postmodernism or as a branding i think is a totally misleading idea in that sense okay and it makes sense what do you think of contemporary art indian contemporary art and You're asking um, me the yeah i'm asking you actually what are your <laughs> views on uh, what are your views on these uh, you know very up and coming uh, artists who, who get a lot of media attention and uh, uh, they they show their works all over the world like there is jitish kalat and there is uh you know these various other people as the names slip my mind right now but you probably know better than me so this is a whole different space i mean they're using various elements they're even using themselves you know as in performance art you know inspired by marina abramovich and so on now you have indian artists into performance art and uh so where you know literally the whole they are trying to reimagine or subvert what is art itself you know i mean andy warhol he said what did he say he said art is anything you can get away with you can call it art and if you get away with it it's fine you're an artist you know and now you see people taking it to extremes literally you know uh um, where somebody will come on a stage perform a sex act or defecate or you know somebody has a dog tied to a pole you know or a woman is standing naked and she invites people to uh, do whatever they want with her and so there are these very very uh, radical and very interesting notions um and they combine video they combine um the 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 whole the environment you know where you have uh, sensory you have they create sounds they create a sound soundscape you know where one of your senses is is uh, you know you know you don't see but you can only hear so there's a lot going on there's a lot of experimentation in this area in india and also in other other uh, are you familiar with this and would you like to speak yes, about it yes yes yeah yes you see uh, it's a endless thing happening and it's a endless uh, items on your plate because uh, the liberation of the technology the democracy of technology social media platform uh, uh, i mean uh, you know, social media is something where there is no censorship in that sense quote and quote uh, there are many possibilities but as a person if you ask me personally i must say that whatever touches me touches my mind touches my eyes or touches my heart touches inside the inner energy i stop on that i stick to that otherwise uh, it's endless like the morning you open instagram you open uh, news uh, you open facebook but uh, you don't read you don't see everything something you see something you just half read something you read completely something you read with your mind and heart and with your all underlines and dots and full stop you know so there are always a category on that so in case of art also for me it's all about that i mean whatever it touches me even if it is a sound even if it is a performance or whatever the uh, advertising the alphabets the billboard uh, any joke whatever it, anything today anything people say it's art well it's art that's fine there is no problem but my acceptance is that area where i get my own taste where i can have the taste you know where my test bird is smelling something because it's a very personal choice i can't generalize it it's very difficult to give any general answer that this is good this is bad no i'm not the person to judge yes, it yes uh, yes yes so everybody is... has their own freedom like a social platform i mean everybody can write anything on the morning uh, whatever they feel like okay if you don't like to see just knows them 
you don't look at them okay you just bypass it even these days it's endless like uh, uh, you know uh, uh, earlier maybe uh, we used to say oh it's too much of food we can't eat actually maybe you have expected some 10 items 10 course dinner or lunch and uh, they gave you some 15 or 20 but now it is uh, some millions and billions of options it, it, it is just out of the control and of course there is a ai that is a huge thing in your life ai is a huge thing because everywhere the navigation is there right so sometime on one point your mind is getting controlled you are living into that patternistic life and it's very difficult to get out from that uh, pattern because the pattern has created the video right. game or the software whatever it's a pattern simple it's a it's a kind of a combination of this and that maybe there are some million there is some few billions whatever of course there is a limitation on that <clears throat> So again, as an artist, I'll, 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 have to, I'll have to leave. Sorry, I'll have to leave now. Uh, I think, okay. uh, yeah, I, I'll, I'll take your leave uh, for now. And uh, I think we can reconvene later. And Vikram can continue talking to you, Shwami. Thank okay. you, Devashish. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. It's a wonderful session, I think. Thank you for talking. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Devashish. Okay, talk to you later. Bye. Later. Bye. Bye. We'll talk again. Thank you, Devashish. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. 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 So, yeah, yeah, Vikram, I mean, that is what I can say, actually. Yeah, because it seems that we have come into a time when art can be anything, literally anything. You know? And um, there is a lot of debate around this, of course. And um, you have people like Damien Hurst. And, uh, you know, he stuffed, he was, he started by stuffing animals. He was stuffing yeah. animals, putting them up on a stage yeah. and selling them for, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. So how do you define value in art? This is another subject. That's you know? another art. That's another <laughs> art, you know. <laughs> I mean... What is it? It's imputed value. It's because it's not value in terms of what human beings need. You know, this is a different type of value. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting. But uh, anyway, so I think. Uh, Do you yeah, think that uh, I have given all the answer? I mean, that is the expected uh, question. Get answered. Uh, you got it. Yeah, I got it. I got it definitely. And uh, thank you for you know for attending the show. And um, we will have to uh, edit it somewhat. And then uh, once it is yeah, yeah. ready, um, I will let you know, and uh, we'll post it online. Okay. Yeah, definitely, and include the image as you mentioned. So yeah. image is also important. Okay. And that way people will understand, okay, how we are talking because sometimes discussion on art, visuals are very important, actually. Right. I'm going because to put them in. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, thank, thank you. Thank you, Vikram. Thank you, Take Samir. Care. Take care. And hope to see you again. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah.